If we don't get to your question during the session, we will be tracking the questions that come in and we'll be sure to get all those answered and posted with the recorded webcast after the event. There is also specific contact information available for Kim or myself that you should see on your screen right now so that you can feel free to email us separately if you have specific questions that we may be able to help with after the session. We will not be checking that during the session. We will be using Twitter as well and the hashtag we are using is hashtag uh, spaces. You should be able to see that hashtag on the right hand side of your screen in the chat box. It's also on the main screen right now and that feed will be monitored as well for questions and comments. I believe that's all I have on the housekeeping things. Um, so now I'm pleased to introduce you to Kim Bowling Cullen who will be our speaker today. Um, we feel very fortunate to have her with us for this presentation. Kim is an experienced librarian, consultant, and author with a broad background in libraries. She is the principal consultant of Kimberly Bowen and Associates, a library consulting firm based outside of Indianapolis, Indiana. Kim has consulted with hundreds of public, school, and academic libraries in the U.S. and abroad, specializing in facilities planning and design and 21st century library services. Her clients range from small rural libraries to large urban facilities and everything in between. Kim is a library journal, library journal recognized mover and shaker, has published three books and numerous journal articles, and is a frequent speaker at state and national conferences. Kim, we are going to put the controls into your capable hands and um, you can get started when you're ready. Um, as, we're, as we're working through this, we're going to change the presenter over to Kim and she will get her screen up and ready to go. It may take take a second here to get this this going, but uh, thank you, Jane. I continue. appreciate it. Just stay on the line and make sure you can see everything, okay? Before I get started. <laughs> okay, so you see my oh. wedding picture? <laughs> or, <laughs> what do you? <laughs> Can you see the presentation? Okay. Yep, we got it all up and ready. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Janet, and I'll talk to you on the breaks. Okay, thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today on Rethink, Re-Envision, Re and I added Redesign, because essentially what I'm um, wanting to chat with you about today is just to share with you some of my experiences over the last uh, 10 to 20 years in trying to re-envision libraries and um, helping us survive and thrive into the future. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of before and after shots today of things, share with you a lot of experiences, things that have worked for me, things potentially that haven't worked. And as Janet said, I encourage you to um, ask questions. If we don't get to your questions, I'm going to be helping address everything so they can post them after the session. Um, when I do a consulting job, typically all of my projects begin with working with the public, the communities, the users, the non-users of all the libraries that I'm working with, whether it's a public library, academic, or uh, a K-12 environment. And essentially we start all our focus groups with this visual just to kind of show everybody what, where's, you know, what's happening in libraries? Where's, where's the transition and how do we find that balance uh, as to what the 21st century library will be? Um, this just shows you, uh, we started uh, with the whole idea of collaborative consumption. We know books were expensive at one time, so libraries formed to uh, be book repositories and archives to provide materials to people that essentially, you know, people couldn't afford books. and so here, here you have the birth of the library. Of course, that's gone on for many, many years. And now, um, in particular, over the last five to 10 years, people in my focus groups are saying, OK, we still want books and materials and archives. Those are certainly um, important. But as we know, uh, materials are shifting into electronic format. So that can mean more and more opportunities for doing different things with the physical space of the library. And what people are asking for is they want more of a community, a cultural hub, um, a place to collaborate and to talk and 
to create potentially and not just consume information. Um, also looking for technology centers and librarians and library staff to be experts in technology. Um, as we're focused on literacy, reading literacy isn't the only thing we should be focused on. Technology literacy should be a huge thing and often needed. Um, uh, librarians can be an expert in this area. So after you know we get started and we talk about the shift in libraries, um, what I explain to people and what I'll explain to you is that essentially this presentation is a way to get you thinking differently about libraries. Um, it's my job to kind of show you the possibilities and what can happen um, and what you know, should be happening in libraries, and then to get you to think in new ways, to think outside the box, um, to really open your minds, and as well as you know, learn from others. So as we go through the presentation, you'll see it might be a public library, maybe it's college, maybe it's school, maybe it's not even a library at all in some of the images. Uh, but whatever it is, I encourage you not to close your mind off because if you're a school librarian, oh, this is a public library, it doesn't apply to me, and, and um, so on. Uh, all these concepts are universal. Uh, they apply to any kind of library. And we can not only learn from each other in different types of libraries, but again, as I mentioned, you can also learn from other environments outside of library land, uh, retail environments, museums, uh, you know, hotels even. So just keeping your mind open and um, even in the image on the right here, this is a library I recently took a picture of, and it's their new book area. Um, you can see it's a European library, but uh, nonetheless, it just has a very forward thinking of displaying the books and getting materials into people's hands. Before we go on, I, I do want to mention uh, one of the things I think all of us should keep in mind is that you, before you touch anything in your space or try to redesign anything, you need to plan. Planning is so essential. Um, it really does pre prevent um, basic flopping, <laughs> having a project flop and not go over well. Uh, you really need to look at the big picture. You know, I'm not one of those people to over plan and to go into committee about every decision because nothing will ever get done. But you really need to kind of think of the big picture. So we talked about talking to the community and, and doing focus groups and getting input. And then um, the spreadsheet I know is a little overwhelming, uh, but essentially what it shows you is there's a lot of analysis to be done about what, what's really happening with our collections nowadays. How are things circulating? Are we keeping things on the shelf that really don't need to be there anymore just because we, we think they should be there or we have this feeling? So, you know, looking at turnover rates and percent of collection and then looking at how many items you have per capita and, and what is realistic nowadays in physical collection. Um, and then looking at how space that maybe has held physical collection could be transformed. That collection could be weeded, perhaps, make room for other things. And I think a lot of you out there, from what I read on your registrations, are looking for how to do things with space, your existing space. And the only way to do that successfully is to really look at how you're using your existing space and to start picking and choosing priorities and, and what you want to do. So having collection analysis right up front is huge. Um, getting that user input, uh, non-user input, and showing them the possibilities. So what I do a focus group, with whatever age group it is or type of group, I do a simple PowerPoint just like what I'm showing you today. I show them pictures of the possibilities and I have them open their mind and say, yes, this would be great, no, I don't like this. Because if you don't show them um, what's out there, what are the options, they're not going to know what to say. They're going to say, I'm guessing maybe we need more books. I mean, they just don't have a foundation for what the possibilities could be. So, you know, even I can tell people, call me or email me, and I'll be happy to share a PowerPoint with you. You can just tweak it the way you need to. 
um, you might as well not reinvent the wheel. Just go out there and use something that I've already invented or, or done. Um, just another uh, basic uh, planning tool that I use with people just to kind of show you what the process is for this whole re-envisioning is that, you know, first we talk about data and the community input, which we um, got under control. Then looking at service. Before you do anything, form should follow the function. You need to look into the future. How is service, you know, how is your library going to operate? What services are you going to provide? What now and what's going to happen into the future? Thinking flexibility, because we don't know. We don't have crystal balls. So we have to think, how, is, how could things change? And how do we then create the best physical space to accommodate these things now into the future? So really understanding service is a priority before you start picking out rugs and rearranging furniture and ordering things. Uh, and then essentially once you get all that, the planning in place, you know, understanding how much things are going to cost, how, you gonna how are you going to allocate your resources. And a lot of my projects uh, with this type of project uh, with the redesign are going to be phased. So you might do something this year and then plan to phase in part two next year and so on. So that's pretty common and something that's also good if you're on a tight budget. Just want to show you a couple images of some projects we've been working on. Simple things even that you can do just to kind of get the ideas rolling. Um, this is a library where we decided we did, um, you, know, you talk to the people, you do the analysis. We decided we needed more semi-private meeting space. We needed more of a popular library where people could easily access new materials and high interest materials. We needed to move the staff around. It's a three-story library. This is just one of the floors. Um, but it's a, a historical building, and we're working within existing walls. So you can see we just took a floor plan. We started working it up to kind of see how things would lay out. Um, here is the base, basement level of the floor, which includes the children's room, and in creating a new teen area, and um, upgrading some things for their friends of the library and staffing. But again, it just gives you an idea how you can plan simply without you know, investing a lot of money in pantry floor plans and, and so on. Um, and this is just the final floor plan. Um, and I'll be talking a lot more in detail about this when I do the children's spaces presentation for DEMCO next month. This just gives you an idea. Um, we're working with an existing floor plan again with lots of angles and trying to figure it out how do we re-envision what we have. And um, this is actually a new children's library that we're, uh, we're trying to envision, thinking about taking an existing meeting room and turning that into more of a children's space and so on. So I encourage you to sign up for October if you're uh, interested in finding out more about this particular space. It's been a very interesting project. So our whole goal here is when we look at these pictures coming up, we're looking at creating customer magnets. That's what I say. I mean, we're in business because we want customers. We, people that we already are serving and we want people that we're not serving. And so the idea is to be a place that's going to draw people in and make people want to stay a while. And, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a Starbucks kiosk, kiosk to make people stay a while. I show it, though, because it gets the point across that to make people stay a while, you need to make people feel comfortable, um, both through service and through space. And what we do and how we design our libraries uh, really reflects, you know, what we think, um, what we think of ourselves, how we view our communities and the future of libraries. So um, opening our minds and looking to the future is never a bad thing. Um, I'd like to show this picture. It was one that was sent to me by an architect friend of mine a few years ago. And uh, I just like it because it really shows you how the physical space relays function and intention. Okay, we don't all have to have fireplaces in our libraries. So, you know, there's a craze for a while. Fireplaces everywhere. Yes, it creates a nice, homey feeling. But essentially, I think what this picture gets across is by using some color, some art, um, really 
making the space warm and welcoming in a very simple way um, can, can tell your customers a lot about you and a lot about the service you want to offer. Now, I know we, I get the boring stuff kind of out of the way here at the beginning. Um, now we're going to jump into all the, the before and after photos. But before I do that, does anyone have any questions up until this point, anything that was confusing or anything they want to address before we move on? Okay, Kim, we do have one question here, um, and that's on what types of things have you done to get non-user input into the process? Yeah. Um, great question and uh, very popular question because that's usually the most intimidating and, and hard thing to do. Um, over the last couple months in particular, I've been doing hundreds of focus groups with people. Um, and one of the things I've started doing is we go to all the key players on the library team. So it's the planning team. I say at the public library, you would go to the board and then you go to the staff and everybody picks 10 users and 10 non-users. So people um, that they know from the library and people they know from outside the library that don't use the library, maybe someone from church, um, the gym, um, and we compile a list based on the types of groups we're doing. So if you're doing a teen group, you'll, you'll do some teens if you want to do a few adult groups. Uh, maybe parents and caregivers, maybe you're a school and you want to divide it into grade. I've had it work really well for a middle school library. Um, so you get this list of people and then you essentially uh, do an invitation. And I have focus group instructions that I share with all my uh, clients that I'd be actually happy to share. Um, if anyone's interested, just uh, let Janet know. Maybe we can post that to everybody. But essentially, if you follow those guidelines and you really think hard about the people that are using the library as well as non-users and try to balance out, you'll get a very um, diverse um, group that will provide you with a lot of good input. I think the letter writing, too, uh, Janet, is probably one of the biggest things. And, and doing follow-up phone calls to remind people and to encourage people to come a lot of times people will throw the letter away, so it's a lot of, a lot about being proactive and pursuing and getting out there, even doing public speaking to different groups in the community to tell them about what you're doing. I mean, I spent most of my time working in libraries. Every month I go public speak at another um, venue just to get the word out. So hopefully that gives you a little background, but again, I can provide you with the details if anyone is interested. Okay, we have one more question coming across yeah. here. Um, just waiting until I get the full question before I before I read it off to you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it's a must to involve people in focus groups before a renovation? No, most definitely. It's the number one thing. I would never do any renovation. Um, without getting your users involved, because um, those are the, the they're the people that are using your library, and we'd be silly for not asking the users <laughs> what's important to them and showing them possibilities and getting their feedback. Um, otherwise, we're just guessing or making assumptions based on our own thoughts, and um, people just you know not everyone thinks like we do or. So yes, I think that is the number one thing you need to do. And that goes hand in hand with your data analysis. Hey, Jenna, okay. I'm going to move on. And yeah. if you get any Sounds others, good. let me know at the next break. OK, so number one tip here in planning, I'd say we're going to start out simple <laughs> by simplifying. Uh, Essentially, I think one of the biggest things anyone can do, and you can do this without any budget at all, is to declutter your spaces. Get things off the wall, uh, to clear off desks, look at the space from a very simple point of view, and then walk in the space, and then trying to figure out what are the key things you need to get people to, and looking at how they're going to visually interact with the space the minute they walk through your door. In this particular library that you're looking at here, this was a renovation. 
of uh, one floor of a two-story building. The soffit at the top happened to be um, a, soffit, a soffit that was built over this big, huge reference desk. Um, this library had three different desks in it. We consolidated down to one desk um, where all staff work um, for adult services, and then they have a, a smaller desk in a children's services and a, a kiosk in teen services as well. But aside from that, simplifying their staffing process was huge, and also then taking this soffit that you see this hang, this hanging from the ceiling, and instead of getting rid of it, we repurposed it. So we figured out, okay, what what is going on here now in the redesign? Well, it's a business center. You can print things here. The photocopier was moved here. The faxing machine was moved here. Um, and, and, and those types of things. So we simply did vinyl lettering, and you can print something, you can send it, very simple user-friendly terms. In the background, you can't see it all, but it's a self-serve holds um, shelving unit, and it says pick it up instead of holds or whatever, something librarian, you know, very lingo and jargony. It just says pick it up. So I think, you know, there are a lot of things about simplifying, you know, simplifying service, you know, visual simplification by decluttering, and then just simplifying language and how we say things and keeping things um, very neat and orderly so when you walk in there isn't a lot of visual chaos like what we see in this particular photo. This was a client. Um, they hired me to do a project Again, one story um, redesign project. You walk in the front door and this is what you see. Lots of clutter, big huge desk, not sure what's going on, uh, where to go for what. Uh, everything seemed very institutional looking as well. So what we did is imagine, wonder if we took out that wall and just opened up the space from the front door. So simple, uh, little uh, simple construction, taking down a wall, Painting a wall, adding some warmth, um, updating the carpeting, uh, moving that service point right out front so you know right where to go, and then rearranging shelving, lowering the stack heights, keeping everything really um, simplified and warm and friendly with an easy flow. Uh, this is an actual photo of the after desk. So you can see that wall is removed. Now we're looking out into the entrance. And so once you walk in, you can just see that service point. We added some art, some a lot of soft seating. Here's another before, very high stacks. Um, just kind of a lot of visual clutter again. And here's what we did in the after. Now this director um, had rebranded. So again, taking something from retail, she pulled in her rebranding into the the physical space design and everything here is flexible. The end panels are modular. Um, we, we painted certain walls that could be repainted easy enough without a lot of cost. Um, the shelving heights are lower. I mean in my ideal world I'd never do anything above a 66 inch height shelf in any library ever again just to you know make that space feel open and to get people to connect with the collection. But lots of, you know, different niches that we've created and places to go. Uh, the lighting um, is softer. Here you can see some uh, flexibility with the casters that we put on the popular library shelving. So all those new high interest items are right by that front door and that service desk. So you can kind of see all the new stuff when you walk in. And again, you can see another the floor photo on the right. Oh, and we have one other. Just kind of shows you these are both afters. But again, for those of you that might have um, issues with power and trenching into concrete floors can be very costly. So one of the things I'm always having to deal with how to be creative with rethinking. You know, how do we get power places for people with laptops, people, you know, just with computers, plugging in uh, other types of equipment. So in the photo on the right, we took the existing 
pillar. We incorporated furniture around it, so it made it more attractive, made it uh, just overall more um, efficient. And then a lot of times we work around re redesigning the space by where the, the power already exists in the floor. So that can be tricky sometimes. So you can see the one in the left. We had existing power, so we, we moved things according to where that was. Last thing with this particular library, I want to even just comment on something, uh, something as simple as outside the library and how you are viewed um, from the street or from your school, maybe from outside from the rest of the, in the, rest of the school in, in the hallway. Um, just thinking about what we're relaying to people. And we see the before uh, image of this particular sign on the left, and then we see that they've upgraded with their branding and also added digital signage. And um, if anyone is interested, you can get uh, more on this particular library with budget and all the different things we did. Um, library Journal just did a case study on them, and the information is at the bottom of the screen, and the presentation will be available to you, so you, can, you don't have to copy it down frantically right now. Flexibility. So I mentioned flexibility with the you know, shelving on casters. If you have 60-inch shelving, you can, you know, anything really that is 60 or below casters is great. Um, I know in states that have earthquake situations, we have something, you know, a little different to deal with sometimes there. But even just the very low shelving on casters is a great idea to be able to get it and move it out of the way. There's one children's library in Ohio. All the shelving is completely on caster, so they can open up the space to create programming space. So that's a great thing to do if you're really short um, on, on space and need options for doing multiple things in a particular area. Uh, this picture that I'm showing here on the right is like a living room area of sorts. You can see the TV in the background. There's a projector in the screen, comfortable living room furniture. But in the other side of this space, you can see that there's these glass partitions that are closed in the picture on the right. And the woman on the bottom left picture is actually, they can slide to the right and they reveal meeting room um, uh, equipment underneath the panels. So you have a whiteboard that can be used also as a projector uh, screen, and you have all the things that you need to hold a meeting. So you can have a functional living room space, but when you need to have a private meeting, you can just close the panels and it transforms into a meeting space. So again, something simple to do that can be re-envisioned without a lot of money and using existing spaces. This is also, I would say this is probably my most popular slide that I show the public um, or, you know, college students or teens, uh, even, you know, upper elementary school kids go crazy for this type of thing. But I call it semi-private uh, collaboration space. So essentially, instead of building costly walls that aren't flexible into the future, you create space using furniture and partitions. Now this is just one way to do it. Um, obviously they don't have to be arranged this way, but it gives you the, the idea that you can create these spaces in a very flexible way where small groups of people or even individuals can kind of have their own area to work in and, and uh, uh, so on. This was a, a project we just finished in an academic library. And uh, the before picture on the left it just was a, just a kind of a catch-all room that you know, had some technology in it, had places for people to get together, a little art gallery space. And essentially what they wanted to transform it into was a uh, space that would have lots of different collaboration spaces that could also be easily cleared out because they often hold receptions in this room. And this is um, a college library. So uh, very active. So as you can see, we did some screening that is a little bit more solid than the screening we saw in the last picture, but 
all of those gray units can be moved around. They're very lightweight. The furniture can be moved around. The booth seating is about the only thing that has some substantial weight to it. But everything in the center can easily be moved by the students. Um, you can see here another view. Um, I've been told that the students are moving the partitions around. Some of them with the tables where the woman is in the background, they create little office spaces. So uh, they now have signs on the partitions that say, please move me. So they know that they're allowed to just kind of create the space they need. And it's worked out really well uh, so far. Uh, you also see they did simple things like paint some walls. They added some artwork. And um, in the right-hand picture, we see just some simple floor lighting because they couldn't afford to do anything with the, the lighting in the ceiling, so they added some task lighting. And that brings me to um, this next topic. I just wanted to touch on this because it comes up a lot in focus groups. Kids, adults, everyone commenting on how poorly lit most of my clients' libraries are. So it's like almost like the top three things that come up. And um, so daylighting and getting a natural light um, is, is really important to people. And it, it shocked me at first. The more I heard it, the more I was like, well, it, you know, it does make sense. It creates a well, warm, welcoming space. And a lot of times this can be accomplished um, very easily by lowering stack height and doing some weeding. You can see the image on the left is a client that um, had very tall stacks. Uh, they were hiding all the natural light. You can see also they were curtained. And we essentially, we weeded, we rearranged the stacks, and then we opened up a nice kind of semi-private area for, you know, studying, or meeting in a small group of two. You can plug in the electrics right there in the wall, new window treatments, and up, you know, nice fresh coat of paint, and there you have it. So it really changed the whole feel of that space just by doing those things. Again, here's another picture of that same library. Uh, took a meeting space with outdated furniture, kind of not the ideal color on the walls, some bad signage, um, DVDs that weren't displayed very well for people to browse through them. And we tra transitioned this particular room into a quiet reading room and moved all of the high-vis items, high popular, you know, very popular um, items out into the main library and to different shelving. So again, some simple changes, just rethinking, reusing their existing shelving, um, not a huge amount of cost involved. Another example of the day lighting and how you can, again, by removing very tall stacks and rethinking collection and how it's laid out, you can open up a beautiful window like you see here and add some seating so people can look out and, in, and appreciate what's going on around them. We talked a little bit about um, service and form following function. So I wanted to make sure that we talk, I mean, service can be a lot of different things. It can be how you're serving the public. It can be what your focus is on. Are you, you know, decreasing physical items, adding more um, e-materials, are you focusing more on programming and outreach, and um, maybe it's that you're, uh, instead of focusing so much on uh, consumption of information, you want to move into encouraging people to create information. So whatever the service model is or the service emphasis that you have, um, I think one of the important things with physical space is to look at that um, the service point because I think that can open up a huge amount of space. So I wanted to show you a couple slides on this. This was the library that had three huge service points and we went down to one service point. So everyone, librarians, clerks, everybody works from one desk. It's located right at the entrance of the library. There's cell check next to it. There's computing on the other side. So staff can really get around and interact with the public. 
The other thing is that we took into account was that what we can learn from retail things. So here you can see, you know, looking at that smaller service point, having the people right there to help somebody that might be using self-check. So if you're going to a supported self-serve model, um, this would be a great thing because a lot of times we put those self-checks way out in no man's land and we, you know, just, oh, it's over there. Well, you've got to support it. You've got to interact with people. It's about better customer service, not necessarily um, not having to deal with people. Uh, you can see here, too, you know, integrating some display. And, and as Jennings County did, looking at how to bring in that, that uh, visual from your rebranding, how to kind of create warmth of space. Just a couple other images from that supported self-service model. Um, you can see simple language again, so that whole simplify thing with checking it out, um, making it easy, things are on casters, can be moved around for the future, pick it up, and this one pick up. So again, simple for self-serve holds, and I've seen this um, implemented in all types of libraries and all sides of libraries, pretty commonplace now. So that's another thing. Um, trying to think, I go to Janet for questions just to make sure I get everyone's questions, but um, a lot of things we could talk about in service here, but those were the, the big things where I think you can save space the most and you can really try to rethink what you're doing and, and try to transform that. So Janet, do we have any questions in that area right now? Okay. Um, we actually have several questions right now. Um, first of all, some of you are, are wondering like how, how to get started on some of these things. You're maybe a little overwhelmed about how to get started on some of these projects. And you have a number of different options there. Um, obviously, um, there are consultants like Kim out there that can help you get started. But um, I don't know if all of you are aware that Demco also has an interiors division of our business that there's a team in place that has often worked with Kim in the past to just help with the planning and some of the layouts and um, with the products and that type of thing. So that's an option that's available. So we won't go into that um, much, much farther. Um, but Kim, could you just real quick, this was kind of off the last area, but rebranding yeah. was one of the things that, that people were wondering just what rebranding means. Okay, so rebranding would essentially, you know, you have your logo, your, you know, how people look at the library from, you know, looking at your website, looking at, well, the logo is a big thing. How, when you do a strategic plan, what's your mission, what's your vision, how do, what do people know you as, what do you want people to know you as? So essentially when people are rebranding, they're looking at what's their vision, what's their mission, and then relaying that in a very visual way. So with Jennings County and with the last library we looked at, they just created a new logo, fresh, uh, kind of more up to date, and then they took that and then they, so everything they do now has that logo on it. Um, so their newsletters, uh, their, uh, so, and then you saw their physical space kind of reflects what that looks like. So it's kind of like the big picture. So you have like a nice cohesiveness of what you want to relate. So when someone sees that, they're like, oh, yeah, that's the library. Um, and we could do a whole presentation just on marketing and rebranding. But essentially, um, that's what, what I was referring to. And this can be different things for different libraries, depending on what type of library you are. Um, and of course, we can. If anyone has specific questions, I'm more than happy to have email conversations with people offline too. So. Okay, I'm just going to give you one more question because I know we have quite a bit more to cover here, yeah. um, and then we can like fill in more at the end. Yeah, um, this one specifically relates to the the self serve model, and um, yeah. this person wanted to know: Have you seen good examples of the use of self serve checkout? while still maintaining connections with customers so the experience is not so cold and impersonal? Yes, and that's what I was talking about at the end. Great question. That's why I call it supported self-service. Supported meaning more interaction with the um, staff, not less. So simple things like I mentioned, locating the self-check, 
right near where, where the staff is, incorporating it into the service desk, um, downsizing your service points in ha uh, so you have a smaller space for staff, not this big, huge desk that's intimidating, and maybe doing little islands of self-serve and having the staff interact with, with the users. So it's about engaging with them. And then you still have people that are going to want not to engage. They're going to want to do it on their own. So that's fine because it's an option, but you're still there. And I think so many times over the years I've seen people roll this out so badly. And that's why it's gotten a bad rap. It, people think it means cold and impersonal. But my clients aren't rolling it out that way. Um, that It means interaction, and, and that's that roving service model, getting people the out from behind that big, huge desk and shrinking that big desk and then getting them to interact with, with people outside of that. So I think that's the key. Okay, so Kim, I'm going to have you go ahead and continue. And then if we have time for some of these other questions at the end, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll answer those offline. Sure. I think we should have some time. Thanks, Janet. Um, just to reiterate, we talked about the popular library, so I wanted to make sure you had uh, um, images and information on that. But again, just the place where you would create, uh, generally at the entrance of the library, all, you know, space for all your high interest materials, new books, uh, audiovisual materials, magazines perhaps. Incorporate seating with it so people can sit down and browse. Uh, you can see in this particular picture, we did a lot of face out merchandising. Could do spine out too. The shelves were very flexible. But look at what they did with their DVDs. They put them laying on their sides instead of spine, you know, lengthwise on this, where you have to kind of turn your head. I do this one much better when I do my in person workshops because I can kind of imitate. But when you have to turn your head and then look, you know, down sideways at all the titles, really hard to find things. So um, just an out-of-the-box way to d display things. Again, here you see another popular library, small downsized uh, service point over on the left, seating incorporated, uh, digital signage, nice clearly defined signs that tell you where things are. And again, when you look at these pictures, the look and feel, just because this might be modern, doesn't mean that you have to be a modern library to accomplish these things. I mean, a lot of my clients are in historic buildings, so you can apply all these principles and just have it look uh, the way that it would, that kind of flows with your particular space. Uh, again, um, you know, look, just look at your display and, and how you're merchandising things. I mentioned short shelves or shelving under 66 inches to me is ideal. Uh, you want people to be able to see what you have. Most of the people in my focus groups, their biggest complaint about libraries is I never go into the stacks. It's too overwhelming. I never browse there. Only if I'm looking for something in particular will I go, well, this makes your stacks browsable. It makes it look, I know, like a bookstore, but you know there are some things that bookstores do well that people like, and this is one of them. Good, clean, user-friendly signage. The picture on the left is flipped through picture book shelving. We're talking an increase in 30 to 40 percent increase in circulation by moving picture books and board books from spine out to flip through because kids can interact with them. They don't interact with spine out books nearly as much as a flip through. So this is another big thing. Uh, looking at, this is a client that was experimenting, experimenting with some things. Uh, the recently turned, returned in particular I thought was great. You can see that the signage is not final. They did it as an experiment. They're, so as soon as things come back, instead of putting them on a cart to shelf, they put them right out on the floor on the shelf so people can browse them again. A lot of the things don't even need to be reshelled. They just circulate right back out. And they were just experimenting with how many shelves they needed and how it would work and lay out. So they did some temporary signage. Now they've got it down, and now they're going to make it permanent. So another really simple thing you could do with your popular materials, um, it helps streamline your service because you don't necessarily 
have to shelve as much, and you can get those things right back out for the public. Um, rethinking meeting space is another huge thing, and this applies to all of us. And this is really a big thing in transforming into a, 20, a successful 21st century library. I talked about collaboration space. I talked about um, uh, people wanting a community center. This is really the heart of a public library for people. They can see this as being a huge need. Even people that don't use the library would come to the library if this type of space was available. So here we see uh, just a kind of a semi-private space again built with off partition walls. Something very simple that you could do. Um, here's just a transformation of a traditional meeting room into something more up-to-date, more user-friendly, people in soft seating with interactive technologies. Um, this is wildly popular with people. And here's an academic environment, a classroom. We have little money. We had to take this uh, great books room and trans transform it into a, a modern classroom. So, you know, modular things, things that can be rolled around, flip tables that can be kind of tipped down their side and pushed out of the way if you had to use the room for something else. So all of these things are a big deal to people. And even this I wanted to show you. I don't know if you guys can see um, in this floor plan. It's a new library I'm working on. But in C down here, it's their new large meeting space. And I think they have it right on for a public library um, for the 21st century. And this would be for academics, too, based on a lot of my academic customers. But a space that can use for classrooms, large lectures, to be divided in half for small lectures. And then they have a flagstone terrace that's going to be off of the side of it with these grand doors that they can then hold private events there. They can generate money for the library. It, it's then becoming that community space that people need. So I think there's so many things going on with meeting space for all of us that we could really rethink that and it's very important to, to people out there. As is computers and technology, I mentioned earlier that people are longing for the library or someone in their um, community to be that technology expert. And um, I think, you know, if we look at a lot of the different things that are going on with computers um, in particular these days, Hardwired computers are great and, you know, obviously still a need to kind of lay them out like we see in this previous um, photo, but leaving enough space so we can collaborate, sitting side by side. More than one person at a computer is, is a big deal to people, whether it's a teenager or a parent with a child or even a staff person with another uh, user. I mean, that is big. And also, I have some clients now that are moving mostly to circulating technology. So taking laptops and having them available at their service points to, for people to check them out and to take them anywhere in the library. So you can see the users here on the left. They're sitting together. They're working on computers together. They're kind of all spread out. Um, it opens up a lot of flexibility options and, um, and space. Uh, in a lot of space limitations, it kind of takes those away. You can see, um, too, there's some really high-interest technologies out there now, like touchscreen technologies that you can push um, the materials up on the screen on the wall so everybody can kind of share. And that's kind of a little beyond our presentation today, but if anyone's interested in that, um, I know several libraries that are implementing that as well. So even preparing for that type of thing in the future. Um, I had mentioned the circulating lap, uh, laptops, but also things that libraries are circulating um, e-readers. So whether to use in-house, a lot of my clients, uh, people can check them out and take them home. So, um, and then they're using them to have you know, classes in the library. So being able to accommodate these types of technology in different spaces is always very important to look at. Uh, the unit on the right is just a laptop dispenser, uh, pretty pricey, and most of my clients are mostly just dispensing them through a person at a service desk. So, um, but there are options out there, to, just so you're aware. Then I had mentioned the other thing with spaces 
to think about that whole idea of creation space and digital creativity. Um, I'm sure many of you have read the articles out there on maker spaces. Um, and there is a big push uh, for libraries to transform into, as I mentioned earlier, into creation spaces, not just a space where people come in and consume the information and check something out, but where they know they can go to create something. So whether it's a video or an audio file um, or even ways to self-publish um, uh, their writings, this is a big deal. And Barrington Library did a really great transformation of a small meeting room space, and that's the Media Lab on the right. Um, they did, you know, chroma, chroma key green screen on two of the walls and then have all the technology people check out the room and use it um, to create videos, audios, and so on. And this has become one of their most popular services for all ages. And I know I see this all, uh, happening in schools. I just did a bunch of focus groups two weeks ago. Um, this was something that was a priority, and it was a rural community, um, and it was a county library in um, rural Indiana, and the teachers and the parents and the, and the students really saw this as a need and something that would draw people in. So lots of things this could be, lots of articles out there, but I think the important thing is to know that it, it impacts space. So when you're looking at the big picture, you need to, you know, consider these types of things and how you want it, how you want to implement it. Um, one of my other clients uses a portable system. That's the one you see on the left, and they essentially, um, people can check this out and roll it from meeting room to meeting room. So if you don't have the space to dedicate like Barrington does on the right, um, maybe your school. I mean, portable technology like this is working and, and very successful as well. Um, just a couple other things to mention. Again, I won't stay very long on this just because we're going to do a full session on it in October. But just keeping in mind that children's space is a big deal, especially in public libraries. Um, for those of you in um, elementary school, understanding how to lay out the space based on the different developmental needs of the age groups that are being served is huge. huge. Um, from early literacy and integrating collection with interactive that promote um, fine and gross motor skills and things that help promote literacy, things for older students that are also engaging them through technology, getting them connected with the collection, and also helping build technology literacy, reading literacy. Um, these are all um, big deal items that we'll talk about in, uh, extensively um, in the October webinar. And uh, here you see the date, October 17th, and we have some more guidelines and things you guys can refer back to. And then uh, Teen Space, again, those of you that know of me know that Teen Space has been a passion of mine for years. And um, it's still alive and strong, um, people doing great things with it, really um, in, in school environments, high school, middle school, public library, and carrying these concepts all the way through into academic libraries now, just making that comfortable, welcoming space, balancing the ed educational and recreational needs. Um, you can see, you know, even small meeting room space and just accommodating lots of different user groups and, and needs is really key here. And making sure the space is the proper size, not just shoved into a corner if you're a public library. Any questions on this so far, Janet? Okay, um, we have a lot of awesome questions coming in, and obviously we're getting really tight on our time here. So um, I'm just going to throw one question in here before we um, before you go to your wrap up, and then I then I wrap things up. But um, the question is, any suggestions for low cost, high impact things that can be done quickly and easily? Low cost, high impact. Yes, that can be done quickly and easily. Well, the decluttering thing is the biggest thing. I'm telling you, I people hire me just to come declutter their libraries and rethink. And it, I'm telling you, it can make the biggest difference 
in the world, and it sounds like the weirdest thing, but I, it, it is a huge deal. Um, I think that a lot of times just rethinking layout and, and weeding, um, if you can do that collection analysis and really take a long, hard look at your collection, you can open up a lot of space without spending any money. Um, there are so many things. Maybe what I can do, Janice, I can compile like a, a fun little list and I can of, of a bunch of ideas and we can post it along with everything else. How does that sound? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Okay, so um, if you just want to continue on here, we're getting really tight on our well, time here. So Yeah, the, um, the last thing I just wanted to say is you know, th this is a lot of information to pack into less than an hour, um, and I'm hoping that you took away one thing. I mean, te technically this presentation would be a half-day workshop. There's a lot of good juicy stuff that we can cover and things we can explore in detail, but my hope was that there was maybe one thing that piqued your curiosity that you will be excited about. And as always, and Janet knows this, and sometimes to um, my detriment, I guess, but I'm always telling people, oh, just call me or email me. Because the thing is, I, I want you to get excited. And then if you need additional information, call, email. I'd be happy to get you on the right path with any of this, um, answer any questions you have. Um, and provide any materials that would help you kind of um, not like I, you know not reinvent the wheel like I said so you can actually accomplish something um, without stressing out about kind of all the details and things so please don't hesitate on that one and for those of you that are interested in youth spaces please join us in October because we'll be able to elaborate a lot on those last few slides That's all I have, Janet. Okay. Um, thank you, Kim. Um, we're going to just wrap up things here. Um, we appreciate your insight and, and how you could share with us how you've helped your library clients rethink their existing spaces to better meet their current and future needs. Um, it's always refreshing to think about these things differently and have the opportunity to see what others have been able to accomplish within their spaces. So there was some great discussion today, and we appreciate all of you sharing your time with us. We will uh, take a look at what all those questions are and, and get all of those answered and get those answers out to you. Um, some of them you might be able to find some of your answers and some ideas out on the Demco Interiors website um, because some of the products that you saw today and some, um, some of the, the possibilities that are out there, you can find some examples on um, DemcoInteriors.com. Um, you will be receiving an email follow-up to this presentation in a couple of days, and that email will include a link to this webcast. So if you missed something or you wanted to review, you can go back and refresh yourself on some of these topics or share it with your colleagues. Uh, in addition, you'll be receiving a survey to let us know how we did today. Please take a few moments to fill that out. Since we're just getting started in our webinar events, we'd love to have your feedback so we can make these sessions even better in the future. Feel free to comment on other topics that you'd like to see information on or speakers that you'd like to hear from so we can consider those when we build those things into our schedule. Um, we do, as Kim mentioned, have some additional webinars coming up. Kathy Hakala Ozperk will be presenting tomorrow from the beginning with a focus on time management on October 3rd. And as Kim mentioned, she'll be presenting Zoning In on Children's Spaces, Engaging Your Youngest Visitors on October 17th and that will have an emphasis on planning children's spaces. So you can go to the DEMCO website to register for those, and we hope that you will consider joining us for one or more of these events. And um, we will announce other events as the schedule is available. So um, that's all we have for today. Uh, have a great afternoon, and goodbye for now. Thank Thanks, you. Jen.